distinctive styling, off-road prowess, and Toyota dependability are great ingredients for an SUV. And it's no shocker that the FJ Cruiser has all of those traits. However, there's a lot more to it that makes this trucky utility vehicle special. Stick around and I'll show you exactly what I mean. If you haven't done so already, consider subscribing. That way you get quality content and I get closer to making this a full-time job. Thank you. Now back to the review. The Toyota FJ Cruiser debuted for the 2007 model year here in the United States. Now obviously I'm not Doug DeMiro, uh, but this thing is really quirky. And you can see that. The standard halogen headlights and front end design pays homage to the old FJ40 Land Cruisers. It also looks like you just told it you found its internet history. You is right, boy! You got caught! You got busted! In some places in the world, the Cruiser still persists. The 2014 FJ was the last model year to be sold in the United States. Tight panel gaps, thoughtful features, and retro but not cheesy looks made this stand out in a positive way to me. Briefly, I'd like to thank the knowledgeable folks at Royal on the East Side for loaning me this pristine Toyota for my review. If you're looking for something new, used, or just plain cool, check them out. Now if you're watching this you probably care about off-road stats and you probably already know what this thing is capable of, but let me remind you, 34 degree approach angle, 9.6 inches of ground clearance with four-wheel drive, 8.7 if you get two-wheel drive, and it can ford through stock 2.3 feet of water. This is a non-functional vent. You might be able to make it functional if you want to. And there are an ungodly amount of aftermarket solutions and mods for the FJ2. Okay, now for something that every car reviewer sings about and not many people notice. This thing has three mini wipers up front, something Toyota did because they wanted it to cover the whole windshield, which is quite short, wide, vertical, and prone to cracks. Things really start to get funky when you come around the side of the FJ Cruiser. These mirrors, they don't stick out. Instead, they actually have a, a pretty tall design. Optional on these things were factory rock rails. That way you don't mess up your now $35,000 used SUV. You're gonna find 17 inch wheels on most FJ Cruisers. They did offer 16 inch ones. They had some that were beadlocks. Uh, you could have the convenience package, which this one does have. Uh, that gives you a rear windshield wiper. You also had the off-road package and then you had an upgrade package. That was for most of the model years. However, earlier models did have uh, just two different upgrade packages. Toyota made many minor changes in packaging to the FJ during its life cycle. So explaining packages to you guys is nearly as convoluted as trying to graduate from an American university. So it says here you've been taking the wrong classes? Well, apparently, but I thought I needed A&H credits. No, sweetie, you need a Gen Ed a &H. You took breadth of inquiry a &H. Different things, honey, different things. But my advisor literally told me take these classes to graduate. Oh, really? Code 3, Mark, get in here. Did you tell him to take these courses? No. Nah. Okay, so what happens now? You don't graduate. Are you shitting me? <laughs> you learned a lot about the Romans though, didn't you, sweetie? Oh, 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 oh. He learned pointless bullshit. <laughs> he didn't need any of it. Fucking idiot. Jokes aside, I should mention there was a TRD Special Edition in 07 that had different design cues along with a beefier suspension and various other upgrades. The Trail Editions with similar upgrades came out in 2008 and was available thereafter except for 2009. I will include a multitude of sources in the description if you have very specific equipment questions. The FJ also has suicide doors, which open at a weird angle, have some storage in them, and lead to a pretty reasonable back seat. It's just the entry that might be a little bit tricky. This wheelbase is actually shockingly tight. It's several inches shorter than the JK Wrangler Unlimited. 
and that gives this a 27 degree breakover angle, which is pretty good. I will talk more about this later, but visibility is horrendous. But hey, the look is neat. These roof racks were also technically an option on the FJ, but most have them. I would also like to say that I have yet to find an FJ without the convenience package online. It seems like a vast majority had it, even with two wheel drive, which makes sense since it came with power mirrors, keyless entry, cruise control, and a rear wiper. At the rear of the FJ Cruiser, the retro styling is just as apparent as it is elsewhere, and you still have a pretty awesome 31 degree departure angle. You can tow up to 5,000 pounds. Adding to some practicality, the rear glass actually opens, and then you're gonna have a swing out tailgate. If you can't tell by now, I am a huge fan of the exterior of the FJ Cruiser, but tell me what you guys think in the comments section. The outside is cool, but I'm more impressed with how the vibes continue on the inside while still providing Toyota build quality. This is probably one of my favorite interiors because it has a very clear objective and it smashes it harder than you should be smashing that like button. Let's start off with quality because this is a trend of the FJ Cruiser. All of the panels, they don't shake, they don't creak uh, the same way that you might find in a Wrangler. Everything around you just exudes durability. And Toyota even thought to give you vinyl floors which allow you to easily clean your FJ Cruiser. Everything is also designed to be used with gloves on, including these dials and these hilariously chunky buttons that wouldn't be out of place in a Fisher Price product. Now, I wish the dials were a little bit more clicky. That would just make the experience that much better. And then you're also going to have a physical four wheel drive lever, kind of like you would get in a Forerunner TRD Off Road or Pro. So the interior feels rugged, but it also provides an outward viewing experience that's replicated in very few vehicles. The flat windshield and A-pillar are far away from the driver, making it feel like a tank or Humvee. The lack of glass on the side and the big spare on the back also remind you that you are driving a special, purpose-built vehicle. The visibility is not great, but after some prayer, blind spot mirrors, and caution, I worked around it, and a backup camera is available. The most annoying part of this design comes from that roof. It extends so far over you that depending on your size, you will probably have to duck your head in order to see a stoplight. I had to do this even with my seat in the lowest position, but I am six foot three. Also, no sunroof option and you cannot remove the top. Now you're gonna have eight way adjustable seats, which is great, but it is missing a lumbar adjustment. Really good amount of thigh support. And also, unlike the Toyota Tacoma, I have plenty of headroom in here. Now the tilt steering wheel is probably the biggest downfall in terms of ergonomics and just having an intuitive interior, but it's something that I've gotten used to with even my own car. And just like Toyota took the time to design a three wiper windshield, um, they took the time to give you two visors to compensate for the really long windows. One of my favorite features in here that I did not expect to enjoy this much was the shifter. Now it looks kind of goofy. It looks like it's trying to mimic a manual, but it's so nice to have the shifter this close to the steering wheel, um, especially if you're in an off-road scenario where you're maybe switching between reverse and drive quite a bit, or if you have the manual transmission. And it's also exactly where you want it to be when your hand is resting on this elbow rest for the driver, which is standard. There's an optional elbow rest for the passenger that comes as an accessory. This is the only car that I've ever driven that can fit a 40 ounce hydro flask in an actual cup holder. But again, for off-road enthusiasts who might have giant water bottles like me, this is great. And the storage in here doesn't stop there. You have dashboard storage, which is kind of crazy. You have pretty decent sized door pockets. You have this open center console area. Unfortunately, I only counted four cup holders total, excluding the center console bin. After a few days with the FJ, the lack of lumbar adjustment proved to be a nuisance as expected. It takes a little to get used to it. Also, the front doors do not shut in a substantial manner. And the elbow rests on the doors are less forgiving than a youth sports coach going through a power struggle at home. Now power windows and power locks were at least standard all the time, but there's no heated seat option. You can't get any kind of navigation. Bluetooth audio and calling does come standard in the 2011 model year and up. Toyota truly just gave you the basics and a few things that you might want, like an optional 11 speaker JBL audio system or a nine speaker in the older model years, uh, which did have this cool 
rear mounted subwoofer that kind of stayed out of the way of your stuff. With the upgrade package for the 2014 model year, you did get the JBL system and you also got a leather raft steering wheel. So now I'm going to adjust my seat in a comfortable position um, and I'm gonna hop in the back. Once you get past climbing into the back seat, this is a pretty accommodable area. I have a few inches for headroom. Now my legroom is a little bit compromised, but the front seat has got a very soft backing to it, so I'm not uncomfortable and I can hold my knees out to the side and be just fine. The seats are well cushioned and supportive. There are reasonably sized cubbies in two cup holders. While legroom won't match the 5th gen 4Runner, I am 6'3 and I think I could sit back here for an extended period of time and be fine, even behind myself as long as I'm not being excessive. Really my biggest complaint with the back seat is that there's a lack of a center armrest and the outboard elbow rest is also less than adequate. The middle seat is going to be a little bit skinnier, but this is really not a torture chamber any way you look at it, unless you're claustrophobic, in which case the lack of a window might get a few passengers riled up, but this is really quite good um, and much better than I was expecting. The back of the FJ Cruiser isn't exactly cavernous, however it's more than usable, it has a pretty reasonably low floor. The seatbacks do have a nice rugged backing to them. These seats do fold flat, 60-40 split, with the seat bottom kind of moving out of the way, making for a cargo area that's best compared to modern small crossovers like a Subaru Forester or Honda CRV. So not only is the exterior quirky and retro, the interior provides this really different vibe. It's unlike pretty much anything else on the market. Plus it adds Toyota quality and unique practical touches, making this thing really stand out, even when you consider vehicles that came out well before it and well after it. And when it comes to driving the FJ Cruiser, not only is it capable, but it's also more than acceptable to live with. For the duration of its lifespan here in the US, the Toyota FJ Cruiser had a four liter naturally aspirated V6. It was dual overhead cam. At its debut, it made 239 horsepower. And in 2010, they added dual variable valve timing, which added 20 horsepower. This 2014 model is rated at 260. and also has 271 pound-feet of torque. Okay, while I know this isn't the purpose of the vehicle, I'm gonna try zero to 60 in here. I'm gonna shut off traction control. Uh, we're gonna be in two wheel drive. I kind of rolled onto the throttle there a little bit. That's 60. It gets up to speed more than fine. It's just that gearing is so damn tall. I think that more aggressive ratios and a sixth gear would make this thing feel so much more alive. As it stands, it's more than enough to hustle this truck around. The shifts are smooth and so is the braking, which has enough grab to make me feel confident in the FJ Cruiser. The transmission tuning of the 5-speed auto is annoying though. It is reluctant to downshift, so much so that when I took the thing through the hills of Brown County, Indiana, I was relying on the manual shifting function, which is well placed ergonomically as mentioned previously. The gas mileage is less than ideal for this kind of power output, so I'm assuming that Toyota did this to try to squeeze out every last bit of efficiency. The automatic models are standard with rear-wheel drive and Toyota's Trick Auto LSD. There's an optional part-time four-wheel drive system with high-low transfer case that most models are equipped with. Manual models have full-time four-wheel drive with a lockable Torsen center diff. If you upgraded to four-wheel drive, you did not automatically get a rear locker technically. You still had Toyota's uh, automatic limited slip differential that works quite well. This model actually gives you the off-road package, which did come equipped with a rear locker, uh, Toyota's awesome active traction control, uh, which can basically break specific wheels to send power to the opposite set. This actually doesn't have the off-road pack, just the upgrade package, which includes the rear locker and A-Track, along with the cool inclometer and compass built onto the dash. But it does not get off-road package equipment like Bilstein shocks and crawl control, which is like A-Track and cruise control had a baby that could only travel about three miles per hour in four low only. Crawl control was in the off-road package and trail team for only 2013 and 2014. Now I'm driving around in rear wheel drive, and I'm just basically going until I can get this thing stuck. But um, the E limited slip differential, which 
you can hear working clicks away can only do so much the four-wheel drive action is nice and smooth even though this model has 86,000 miles it very quickly gets in there and then of course with that shifter in the very nice ergonomic place um, I can quickly shift back and forth the FJ Cruiser with the manual transmission came with four-wheel drive only that was a six-speed manual Manuals came with the same equipment in the off-road or all-terrain package as the auto, minus crawl control. Later, I took this through some really steep, icy, snowy gravel roads and it performed great. I could hear the ABS system clicking away with 8-track on, which requires 4 low, and it felt unstoppable. I wish I had footage of that, but in summary, it's adept in off-road scenarios and could have done way more than what I threw at it. Plus, you don't need to get the most loaded spec to get the off-road package. There are a plethora of options to upgrade this thing aftermarket, but out of the box, this thing is very capable, and in stock form, it's pleasant to drive. Personally, on the road, this thing feels like a newer Toyota 4Runner, which is great. There's not this dissonance between the front and rear axles like there is in Tacomas. And when you go over rough bumps, yeah, the vehicle reacts, but it really doesn't crash through the cabin. I'd have to say that at no point during this drive have I been uncomfortable. And at speeds of over 70 miles per hour, this is so much quieter than what I found with the Jeep Wrangler. Even the new model, the JL, this is really, not bad and you would think this would be a horrendous because of the way that the vehicle is shaped it's pretty much just a brick going down the road so yes wind noise is pronounced but um really it's not all that bad and if i didn't have the roof racks on here it'd probably be even better too and going around corners this thing reminds you that it is still definitely certainly a truck the steering is slow however the steering wheel is a manageable size and it's also quite precise, making this far from a hassle to drive down pretty much any road. And its width, while still pretty substantial at 74.6 inches, is still manageable in most conditions. It's a shockingly easy car to live with. And over this pretty rough road, there are two major things that I'm noticing. One, the ride is quite forgiving and it's not too bouncy. I never feel like the vehicle is really losing composure here at all. And the next thing I notice is that there's really no creaks in here. I'm not hearing any suspension noises uh, that I shouldn't be. And while this is only seven years old and doesn't even have 90,000 miles yet, it's still noteworthy when a vehicle drives like it just came off the showroom floor. Although I should note that I could hear some window chatter over imperfections on quiet roads. And the JBL audio system, which sounds great, did rattle the passenger door panel at higher volumes. Now for the elephant laying on my chest. The price. With under 70,000 miles, it is quite common for these to ask for their 7 year plus old MSRP, or more. An example like I have here can easily run you $30,000, $35,000. You might think, okay, if this was $20,000, I'd buy it. And I'm in the same boat. And that's because I don't have $35,000 to buy an old FJ Cruiser. But there is nothing on the market today that is quite like this. When you consider the back to basics approach, reliability and quirkiness, you know, you could argue that the new Ford Bronco is kind of taking over some of that. And I could agree. However, I, I don't see that being as simple and dependable as the FJ Cruiser. The FJ Cruiser has been an ultra dependable vehicle for its whole lifespan, but not perfect. I dug through consumer reports, cars.com, carcomplaints.com, and FJ forums. I found that some early models suffered from automatic transmission problems and manuals had issues with the throwout bearings making noise. Inner fender bulging and cracking was also an issue, especially for pre-2010 models. It's largely a cosmetic problem. Overall, the FJ Cruiser has left a lasting impression on me. It does not defy its truck-based roots. Its slow steering, bouncy ride, and meh fuel economy reminds you of that, but it avoids being offensive or harsh in just about every category, something the Wrangler just can't say. Adding good build quality, nostalgic styling, fun quirks, or course reliability, and off-road capabilities that would make a grizzly bear sweat, and you have an awesome truck. You can whip an FJ Cruiser day in, day out with little punishment, and given its crazy resale value, you shouldn't lose much of your investment like you would with pretty much any other vehicle. If you want a quality, do-anything truck 
that gives off unique vibes and you got the cash to fuel your desire, the Toyota FJ Cruiser gets an astounding yes from me. If you don't care much for the it factor or the bill for one of these would stretch you too thin, get a 4Runner. If you enjoyed the video, then be sure to subscribe and hit the bell, and I'll see you in the next one.